Hey guys, my name's Mannequin and welcome back to Mastering Idiom with Logic Pro. Um, so today's video is going to be a little bit different than I would initially I was initially planning. Uh, sorry about that. And um, so uh, what I was initially going to do is I was going to do another example for mastering, but I've already done two full examples and um, some of the other videos I've done a very large portion of a mastering example. So I thought it would kind of be uh, better to talk about right now is meters because uh, I kind of want to talk about just generally speaking usage of meters and how much should you rely on them, how much should you not rely on them. I know I touched on this briefly in a different video, but I kind of wanted to show you guys um, in comparison to uh, a couple of other tracks how you would use metering to kind of determine um, how, you know, where your track stands in terms of a good master. So, um, the first thing uh, I want to kind of talk about here is this one is my track and these two are professional tracks. I think that's a fair comparison. And the reason I say I think it's a fair comparison is because um, it's um, – I'm striving to get a professional sound. So I need to be comparing against professional tracks. So, um, so right now what I have loaded on the master bus is TR meter. This is actually um, – that's short for um, – it's T-rack meter. Um, and you could find this. It's a free plugin by uh, IK Multimedia, and um, you just get the uh, T Rack uh, Custom sh uh, something. Uh, and it, it's a free pl um, plugin collection you could download. It'll download a whole bunch of crap. Um, you could see here it basically gave me 30 plugins, but I can only use some of them. It'll pop up and saying, "Oh, you haven't purchased this." So just kind of keep that in mind um, when you get the custom shop. You will not necessarily have access to all of these you know, they'll just install them anyway. But TR meter is on here and that's what I'm using here. Um, I'll show you why I'm using this uh, in a second, but for now, um, I'm gonna show you the three tracks here. This, we have a track um, by, um, uh, okay, this is Tritonal, Now or Never, and this one is um, 3LAU, I believe. I don't remember for sure. Um, I, should, I think I have 3LAU. So um, so th these are some pretty popular tracks that, um, that got relatively like they they're relatively out there in terms of um people have heard them and uh so so i'm kind of not choosing obscure tracks i'm choosing professional tracks that are very mainstream and are kind of similar to the style of my track so this is my latest track that i've done uh, a remix for and it's also one of the tracks my best best mix and master yet um and it's uh it's my remix of fade by king's justice so originally like a rock song and i kind of just took it and turned it into a uh, kind of like a progressive house song, um, but it's the BPM is way too fast for a progressive house song. So uh, I'm gonna turn on the volume here, just so it's not like kind of blasting us out. And then we'll kind of, I'll show you a section here that I'm gonna be comparing against. And then I'm gonna kind of show you what these ones sound like in their similar sections. So let's see if I can find this right. Okay, so you kind of got an idea of the different sounds of these tracks, and um, one thing that I wanted to point out is there is a there's not really a 100% standard for professional tracks. So um, one of the things you could probably tell right off the bat was when I switched from this one to this one, they sounded very similar. So. Yeah, Um, I have to admit that mine does have less bass, uh, but that was just kind of something that I, I, I kind of was shooting for a little bit less bass than I usually put in my tracks because I know that sometimes they tend to put way too much bass in. So 
Um, that's kind of, that was uh, a, l- a little bit too, uh, I didn't put quite enough bass in in the end, but um, it's it, it's still rather close to this track right here. But you'll notice if I compare directly between this one and this one, there's a drastic difference. Mine sounds a lot softer than this particular track. So, uh, so I said I was going to talk about meter- metering and why you, why or how you should rely on this, and um, and so how does me kind of telling you the difference between these really have anything to do with metering? Well, um, the thing is, when I was listening to these, I could tell by listening what the difference was in my tracks. Now, if you can't tell, that's when you might want to look at a meter. Um, cause in my case, I could tell you that, uh, between these two tracks, there's, uh, mine doesn't have quite as much bass and between these two, mine sounds smoother, but it doesn't sound anywhere near as loud. Um, so and that's easier to tell at louder volume. So if you run up this video at a louder volume, you kind of tell that, um, it becomes more evident at louder volumes than at lower volumes. Um, but, uh, but you can kind of tell that there is, this one is considerably louder than mine. And it's also, um, it has a lot, uh, heavier bass and it also has a lot brighter high end. Uh, mine just kind of sounds smoother and more rounded overall. So, um, so it, does that mean my mix is wrong? Now it doesn't necessarily mean that because I kind of told you here, this is, um, three Lao, I believe that's how you pronounce his name, uh, or Elao, something like that. Um, uh, but, uh, the, this particular track is basically very similar in sound signature to my track. So, um, that can't mean that I'm mixing it wrong. And that doesn't mean that tritonal is necessarily, or not mixing, sorry, but mastering. Um, and it doesn't necessarily mean that tritonal has a bad master either. It's just, there are differences and you just kind of, kind of, you have to choose which one you want to shoot for. Um, uh, personally, I tend to be safer um, so, uh, I, I tend to shoot for a master that isn't as, um, as loud as it can be as, uh, because I don't want to necessarily get distortion. This track, on the other hand, you could really tell that it has a lot of distortion in the master, but it brings up the volume level considerably. So it just kind of depends what you want to go for in the end. Now that said, does that mean that this is a bad master? No, not at all. Because first of all, the distortion sounds okay, actually. And additionally, when you go to the quieter parts of the track, it uh, if you watch the meters here, watch how low they go. The walls are paper thin. You're moving in. And then if you go to the louder spot, they just skyrocket. Whereas mine, if I go to the quietest spot, I'm so dry, a queer look from a passerby. That's a little bit better of an example there. But I don't wanna, I don't wanna fade then when I go to the drop. So you can see here, the, the thing about this track that makes the master so good is that it has a lot of dynamic range. And what dynamic range is basically the difference between the quietest spot and the loudest spot. And um, generally you could also look at dynamic range with other meters. And um, I don't know if this one, I don't think this one has a dynamic range range meter on it, but I don't believe I have a, a different meter. Hmm, I'll have to check really quick. Uh, Vox and MSED overtone. No, it doesn't look like I have a dynamic range meter. But if you watch what a dynamic range meter does, is it kind of um, it watches the the overall RMS signal. And um, so if you if I were to pop back up the metering multimeter here, and if I were to watch the RMS signal here um, on this particular meter, that one right there and just kind of have a little bound between when it goes to the highest, when it goes to the lowest, and just kind of slowly adapt that bound um, over time. So basically, um, it's kind of like finding just generally the range that the uh, RMS value, the value that this is kind of bouncing around at. So you can see at this particular area, it's kind of staying around there. So it'd be rather small right there, 
but now it's moving up and down a lot more. So it kind of be between here and here. That's what a dynamic range meter tells you. And it basically tells you the difference between um, the two uh, areas there. So if you had uh, the top was at negative 10 and the bottom was at negative 20, then you'd have a dynamic range of 10 decibels. So um, I believe that's correct. I don't use dynamic range meters all that often though. Um, now in EDM, you don't have to worry too much about dynamic range, but in uh, recorded styles of music, you do have to worry about it a lot more. But the thing, once again, that you'll notice is despite the fact that this track goes and it clips a whole ton in the drop, when you go down to the quieter sections, they are beautifully quiet relative to it. And it doesn't sound like, um, it doesn't sound quiet, but uh, in a level sense, it's quiet. So um, that's kind of, you know, the question you should be asking yourself is, um, is are the trade-offs you're making good for the track? And um, once again, this is kind of where, uh, another thing where meters come in useful for. Uh, I did talk about how if you can't tell the difference between uh, two different things, you'd want to use meters. I'll get more into that later. Um, but just kind of, this is uh, one of the other things that I wanted to point out here. Um, meters are great for telling you, you know, uh, how much are you pushing the mix and are you pushing it right? Now you'll notice this one when we go, um, when we have a transition here, it goes down really low and, um, and then it goes back up. Uh, you can kind of look at my track. I only have one spot that's kind of a little bit less active. Um, kind of similar to this particular spot in the track here. But if you listen to their spots, you could, uh, you could tell more so the kind of what's happening. So right here, uh, if you take a listen, um, you could hear what's going on. So basically what happens is it drops down completely and then goes back into the track. I don't have anywhere like that in my track. Um, so the closest thing I have is kind of something like this. Where it kind of goes from a more upbeat section in directly into another section. That's kind of what I have here. So uh, I think, what the, where's the draw? So that's kind of what that is. Um, and then in the beginning, once again, uh, after my intro, let's see if I can find it. There we go. You could tell that it goes straight into it. And it doesn't really have like a complete drop down. So that's why I don't have this. But otherwise, um, if you just kind of cut out this section here and looked at it, you'd see that it goes straight from there to there. So it's not as big of a dynamic range as this particular track where it goes, it's like right here, it's very, uh, the, the level is a lot lower than the rest of the track. So um, that's a lot of information there in terms of uh, you know the the differences between these. But how does it really translate to using meters? And that's kind of one of the things that we really want to know uh, because one of the things that I did talk about in my previous mastering videos was that you want to compare your track to other tracks. And if you're not just listening, what else could you be doing? Um, well, we have a couple meters here. So, um, so this is a peak meter uh you could just kind of see when it's just following the peaks and um most of the time this thing kind of bounces around at zero and stays at zero when you're when we're at the drops for all of these tracks and um and then the perceived loudness is the thing that changes a lot more um then we have the phase and we have a spectrum so um i actually changed this from the default set settings for the spectrum the spectrum actually has a um what's called a tilt on it when you first pop it open, I'll show you what that looks like here. If I go um, and just kind of play this back, you watch the, uh, the spectrum here. It looks generally flat, um, and that's with a three decibel tilt, but if I take it and t uh, take the tilt off, then it looks more like the other meters that we were looking at. Where it's kind of downward sloping with that sort of bump sort of thing where it goes uh it goes peaks high in the base and then goes down and then bumps up again and then goes down So 
So, um, so you can kind of see a couple things here, uh, just in the spectrum. Um, for when we when I take this tilt off here, you kind of see the sound signature is generally the same. But if you watch the spectrum in my track and this track, um, and then you watch it in this one, you'll notice that this this one um, becomes the spectrum is a lot flatter and it's a lot pu it's pushed up a lot higher as well. So just watch this again. So the bass is really pushing it on this one. You can notice there's a bit of headroom there and a mine. There's a bit of headroom, but this one kind of like takes the bass and kind of pushes it up quite a bit. You'll also notice in the uh, low sub bass here from 20 to like 30, um, we have uh, a lot more buildup in this track by Tritonal. So in the end, they basically have a lot more bass and a lot more, just generally across the spectrum, uh, a lot more sound. And that is partially because they're distorting it a lot. And when it starts to distort, you start to get harmonics. So stuff from the bass will distort and end up in the high end. Stuff from the high end will distort and end up in the mid range. And stuff in the mid range will distort and end up in the high range, high end and mid range or low end. Sorry. Ooh, yeah. Um, but, uh, so you kind of see when you start to push it more, it does, uh, it distorts, but it pulls up the volume level louder. And you could actually see that in the meter, by the way, um, that, you know, you're hearing it distorting and you could watch everything go up. And then we'll talk about the perceived loudness later, uh, or actually right next here. But, um, but with the, the first thing I want to mention before I get into that, this is why I said later, um, is that the peaks for all these, whenever it goes into drop, the peak basically just sits at zero. I take that back with um, with how you love me. The track actually um, it's not pushed quite as much as these two other tracks in terms of uh, the drop. So um, so this one does kind of bounce around a little bit more in the um, in the with the uh, peak meter, but um, but still it is kind of pretty much um, bouncing and hitting zero and uh, not not going you know too far down for most of it it's it's just kind of whenever it bounces up basically that's a kick pushing it whenever the kick pushes it it hits zero and it doesn't go um anywhere lower whereas other parts of the track sometimes it can kind of bounce to zero and then bounce to something here and then bounce to zero and then bounce to something here um but with the drop we're kind of you know keeping it basically it's peaking at zero all the time. So, um, but but in the case of this track, like I said, it is peaking at zero, but it is kind of going down a bit lower and a bit more often than these two tracks. So um, I could actually order this and kind of have this a little bit differently. We could do this here, push that one there, push mine there. We kind of say the way that the mix has been um, pushed in, in this kind of sense. So this one's not been pushed as much as mine. And this one's been pushed more than mine. So this is kind of a nice order that we kind of drop this into. So now, perceived loudness. Um, this is one qu a question in the live stream that uh, someone came up with. And I kind of want to put this in my Mastering EDM series because uh, it was a very good question. Um, how much should we worry about perceived loudness? And he did ask it a different way. He was kind of saying, my tracks don't ever reach the perceived loudness of other tracks. Is, you know, how do I get it there? And is that really like, um, you know, is that a really a bad thing? Um, it's not a bad thing. You can kind of see the perceived loudness on these jumps around a lot in different parts of the track. So if you watch the perceived loudness here, I'm going to bounce through a couple sections of the track. And uh, so I'm going to have the first break, the drop, and then we'll go into the second break, which is going to be a little bit more upbeat. And then we'll do the same thing for my track, um, except for I might actually uh, find a build and then the drop and then one of the breaks just because uh, I know the sound's going to be different there. And this one, again, we're going to do the same thing, um, break, drop, and then second break. So let's see if I could find those in a good order. But kind of watch the perceived loudness meter and watch how much it bounces around. The reason it's building up in volume is because of that piano.
So I'm going to stop right here before I go into my track actually. And this is a great thing to illustrate. You can't always follow perceived loudness because perceived loudness doesn't actually know. Um, so kind of what perceived loudness does is it actually takes um, a lot of the fact that around uh, 1K to 10K is where when that is at a loud level, that tends to sound louder to us than bass at a loud level or um, or or very high treble at a, a at a high level. Um, treble is kind of unique in the way it works because sometimes um, when you push this up too much, um, it'll start to sound harsh very quickly. But that's why we try to keep it at a lower level in general. So um, kind of a little bit of conf confusing information there in terms of the way treble works and the way bass works. Bass. It's m numerically, the level gets high really fast, but it doesn't sound extremely loud to us. And in the high end, we try to keep it very low because it gets harsh so fast. So generally, what is perceived loudness is looking at is looking kind of at the 1K to 10K region and kind of measuring the amount of information there. You'll see this very, uh, very easily in my track here. But uh, just kind of showing you when we don't have a lot of activity around here, right here, perceived loudness is really low. Because basically with the high end, we have a lot of stuff in the uh, in the air around 10. We have some stuff around the 1K, 2K area, but they've, cu they've kind of actually cut out some of the 2K to 5K area if you listen to the vocals. Perfect, I'll never try. So that was the decision they made there, and you'll notice the piano is kind of building up around this region. So that's why the perceived loudness is not so high. And uh, then when we go to the uh, the drop here... Perceived loudness goes up a little bit, but it's not actually shooting past the uh, the end of this green region. It's just kind of at the beginning of it, and um, and that's kind of makes sense because the drop sounds rather smooth. Now, when we get some vocals into the uh, in the drop, it tends it'll push it up a little bit more, and you kind of see that. Okay, uh, I think the vocals and the drop are in the second section over here. But um, anyway, it does push it up a little bit more. So um, so now we're going to go into this part, and this part you'll notice is has a higher perceived loudness than the drop. You get what you give, that's the simple truth. Right around, as soon as the kick comes in. So between the background synths and the vocal, it does tend to push up this perceived loudness a bit more um, for this particular region. Um, this the, the drop has been smoothed out. So it's just kind of um, leveled out in a sense that when you master it, um, it doesn't push up the perceived loudness as much. But this, the focus of this area is the vocal. So when you push that one up, it does actually pull up the perceived loudness in this area a bit louder. So that's that. Now, just kind of uh, reiterate this point. I'll kind of show you somewhere in my track. So um, we'll we'll actually start right around here because this is the more chill break that I have. Perceived loudness is really low. RMS is relatively low too. But I but the instant the vocals come in, it just skyrockets. And that's because the way I tuned the vocals in this one, um, I had them so they were focused mainly around this region here. So basically I kind of did a boost around here, which is from the one to 10 region basically. So um, you could see there that um, that's basically, you can't just follow perceived loudness as generally for the track, you know, how loud is it? Um, it's it's very focused on a particular region and kind of when you hear it. So, um, so one of the things you can follow though is RMS. RMS is a bit more uh, truth because it kind of takes the volume level um, over time and kind of averages out in a, in a way that makes a lot more sense mathematically. So, um, so thing to learn, when you are listening, you listen. When you are looking for uh, things that you can't hear, you use a meter. So uh, RMS is a more mathematical approach. So it's not something you should be particularly hearing as much, but 
uh, a tuned ear can hear kind of what's going on in the RMS, but it's a lot more difficult. So that's why the RMS meter is relatively important. If we watch the RMS meter, we kind of get an idea of what it does. So this makes a lot more sense here. When we are actually looking at this, in the lower sections, the RMS tends to be low, lower than the perceived loudness. Um, so, in, And this is just kind of the way it happens with these quieter sections. Oh, but I promise I'm worth it if you just open up your eyes. So you see the RMS tends to be lower. Then when we go to the drop, The RMS is higher than when we're in the quieter section. So that makes a lot more sense. So RMS is a lot more useful in that sense, but uh, perceived loudness can be kind of uh, good for getting an idea of when you go to different sections of your track, how are they gonna be viewed in terms of almost harshness? So that's kind of um, what parts are gonna stand out in your tracks more. So you, you notice here when we, we had this region had the highest perceived loudness of this track, and that kind of makes sense because if you listen to it, This one tends to sound a little bit harsher. Um, now it does it does sound quieter as well because it is the break. It's designed to be quieter, but it does sound a little bit harsher in the high end than this one. This one just kind of sounds average and smoothed out. So um, so that's that. I've been focusing on this track a lot. So let's bounce over to now or never and do some stuff here. Now uh, we're gonna do the same thing. Watch the perceived loudness and RMS, and we'll kind of compare between them. So right now the RMS is higher because of the bass. The bass is really pushing up the level a lot more. But as soon as the vocals come in, perceived loudness goes higher. But this one still stays around here and kind of shows you, um, despite the fact that we're going, um, we're going up in perceived loudness, the RMS is generally staying the same throughout this area. So it does pull up just a little bit, but that's because if you kind of watch the waveform, uh, this part is a lot more sparse than this part. So um, it does kind of make sense. Things are added as well to kind of fill it out a bit more. So RMS does go up a little bit, but it generally stays the same. And then as we go, RMS is starting to build up. And in the drop, the RMS just gets insanely high. Now this is a lot higher than the RMS in our tracks. Um, that'd be this track and my track. So my RMS is at around negative eight during the drop and this one is just under negative eight, but this one goes all the way up to negative six. So, um, so that's great uh, to just kind of tell you, you know, this is a lot more representative of how much you're pushing the master. Peak just kind of tells you that you've mastered it. If you're hitting zero, then uh, basically tells that you've done some mastering on it. But uh, when you watch the RMS and you compare the RMS between tracks, that'll give you a lot better idea of, if you can't tell, um, it'll give you a better idea of which track is actually louder in terms of how much uh, mastering has been done to it. So you kind of tell, like I said, the order. Uh, this one, so, uh, we, we ordered this in terms of how much they were pushed. And this one, when we wa looked at the drop, it's just slightly lower than mine. And then um, this one, once again, is a lot higher. So that's generally um, what you would use RMS for. It's a great thing to kind of keep in mind. Um, if your track is really far down in the drop, like it's at negative 12, well, uh, all the tracks you're looking at are like negative eight, negative six, chances are your master will probably need a little bit more work. 
Um, but once again, if you can't push it further, don't push it further because it'll just sound nasty. Um, so uh, now how could I um, – before I get into phase here, I, want, I do want to talk just a tiny bit about phase. Um, how could I actually push my track to the point of the tritonal track? And um, the, the way I could do this is actually not that hard. If I were to get a EQ here and kind of get um, – uh, I'm going to boost around here and then just kind of cut, do a very soft cut in the high end. So it's almost like a peak, but uh, but it's kind of more shelved than a, uh, a regular peak would be. So it's like getting one of these and spreading it out more like that. But um, So what I could do is I could just kind of... tell it changes sound signature a little bit there and if I were to put this before my mastering chain which is not in this project so I can't actually show you that but if I were to put this before my uh, mastering chain then it would have been and I would have pushed my um, clip limiter on if you remember when we were doing limiter six here here we go limiter six if I were to push my clip uh, digital clip here and I would have boosted the output more than I usually do um, and I would have had a a little bit more of a harsh EQ, so it was more focused on the high end, right around here, did a little bit more of a cut down here, boosted the bass, um, and just kind of basically shelf this a little bit more, um, Then and then push that through the, uh, the clip, then it would have gotten a lot closer to this track. But I wasn't wanting to do that because um, I, I kind of felt that my track was in a good spot, uh, and I kind of wanted excuse me, kind of wanted to be in the spot more like this track. And it ended up being like that. I wasn't actually comparing to this track in the end. Um, I didn't compare it to any tracks when I was doing my master. It just kind of turned out like this track, which is kind of funny. Um, uh, this is just two of the tracks of a similar genre that I was pulling in. So uh, make sure this isn't on here. And so that's that's kind of, you know, you can push it further. And it's just how much um, are you generally shaping the sound? So if, you, if I shaped it smoother and then tried to push it, then I wouldn't have been able to push it as much and it would have ended up more around this one. And if I shaped it harsher um, and I shaped it more towards this track in terms of the uh, sound signature, then I would have been able to push it a lot farther and kind of get this sort of distorted uh, push sound. So that's almost all the tools. Now we're just left with one final tool. Oh, I did want to mention one other thing in terms of spectrum, but I'll talk about that after I talk about the phase tool. So the phase tool here, just kind of generally, um, when you're uh, the stereo spread and how things are going around there. Now, if you go into your drop and it's full stereo, like you have a lot more going in the left and right direction than in the uh, mono direction, then you want to be kind of careful because um, the way, well, at least Electro House, I know there are some genres that kind of go out of this. I know ambient styles are not as um, tied to this particular sound, but with dubstep, Electro House, trance, and everything like that, um, you want your, your loud, uh, upbeat, uh, pulsating uh, sort of sounds. You want them to be focused dead center. So if you actually look at all these... It lights up most around here and a little bit over here. Um, and if we look at this one, it's very centered. And mine's just a little less centered. So it's once again, very similar in terms of how we've ordered it. This one's least stereo, this one's a little bit more stereo, and this one's the most stereo. Um, so this one has been pushed a lot more in the stereo sense and you can kind of hear that in the track. Um, this one sounds a lot more centered. This one kind of feels like it's been spread out more though. So uh, now we could go into the question of how well do these fare in mono? And I, I might as well just do that. This one will probably fare the best in mono.
So interestingly, this one actually holds up in mono really well. Now the, the, the entire stereo sort of sounds do get lost because we are switching to mono. Uh, but that's kind of for all the tracks here. So this one, I was, I'm kind of surprised that this one actually fares so well in mono. Um, but the one thing you want to uh, worry about is if your drop is centered more in a stereo sense than it is in a mono sense, then um, you got to be careful because that can cause phasing when you drop it in mono. Why does that matter? Well, most clubs um, and uh, are kind of set up for mono still. Um, not well actually that might be a bad stereotype but it's it's kind of you need to make sure that your track works well in mono and if you make sure your track sounds good in mono as well um, then you focus a lot more of your dynamics in mono which makes a lot more sense than focusing your dynamics in stereo so um, when you're doing compression you should be kind of suiting it towards mono now um, I, I I have other videos that kind of talk about dropping mono to stereo and and doing adjustments in that sort of sense so I'm not going to talk about that here but um, but you could kind of check out, uh, I don't think I've actually done a dedicated mono and stereo mixing uh, comparison video, but I should do that. So I'll, I'll kind of add that. You know what, maybe that could be the next series. Just kind of talking about, hmm, no, that wouldn't be a series. That'd be like a couple of videos. Maybe we'll do that for the next couple of videos. Uh, just talk about mixing in mono versus stereo, why it's important and how you would go about approaching that. Um, so anyway, that pretty much covers all the tools here. I did say I want to talk about one more thing in regards to um, the spectrum. And that is this, uh, you, can, you, can, you can always go overkill with meters. So someone was talking to me um, about uh, span here. So if I drop in span and I go um, to a high resolution mode here and look at these various tracks, um, he was asking, uh, how do I smooth out and get rid of these peaks here? And I'll show you what he means by that. He was confused as to why there were so many peaks and he had to kind of deal with it. So let's see if I could actually get rid of the, um, I think this is a slope here. We'll just set this to zero. So we have a little bit better of a representation relative to the other ones. And he was kind of saying, okay, how do I, in the mastering stage, how would I smooth those out to kind of get rid of those um, and my answer was, you don't. Um, if you look over here. This one has less peaks because it's been pushed so much, but if I go over to this one, it'll probably have just as many peaks as mine. Okay, I do have to admit, mine does not, uh, mine has quite a bit more peaks, but that's kind of uh, between, uh, I could kind of explain the reason why for 3-3. This one is smoothed out very well, so it's kind of been uh, mastered, so that is a smooth sort of tone, and that kind of does end up uh, smoothing out some of these peaks. But you'll notice there are definitely still a whole ton of peaks there. Now, mine has some harsh peaks, you kind of see. Peaks a little bit more than this one, um, but this one actually has a lot smooth, more smooth peaks. Now it has a more focused around here, and the reason why is because the high end is distorted quite a bit. So normally the reason these peaks stand out is because kind of to show you notes. So if you actually watch um, and you get a synthesizer, drop it underneath and you um, hit a note, if you move down a note, all the peaks will move down by a certain amount. So it's kind of just to show you notes. This one doesn't show as many uh, peaks in that sort of sense because the high end is distorted so much. You'll see in the mid range, it shows a lot more. Mine, it actually, uh, a lot of the tones in the high end shine through very well. I didn't smooth them out much. I made them bright, but I didn't distort them either. So that's why we have a lot more peaks around this area because the various tones coming through. And then if we go to this one again, as less in the high end because it's smooth, but still has some around here. So what I said to him was the issue is you're running this at too high of a resolution. Um, it doesn't really matter. This, this high, these high peaks, 
they, you know, you could kind of learn some things off of them. Like I kind of explained to you the difference between the three of them and why they had those differences, but you don't need to do that. So if I go to the, uh, change the uh, do, 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 slow block size, here we go. If I drop the block size to something like uh, 2000 and we look at these, that's a lot more what we're used to seeing by way of an EQ, kind of like this one. Or spectrum, sorry. But even then, this one, uh, this one is a lot lower resolution than the one I'm using here. So I could pull it down all the way to like, I don't know, 256 or something. And then of course it doesn't have an equal amount across. So, um, so it's still a different representation, but, um, whoops, sorry. So, uh, moral of the story is when you're looking at spectrum analyzers for mastering, don't look at too much detail. Um, and actually when you're using spectrum analyzers in general, I would generally say don't use too much detail unless you wanted to check. So how does my track compare? Um, are the, uh, are the, is the high end shining through on this one or is it more focused on the mid range? Am I distorting the high end or am I smoothing the high end? So, um, so that's kind of, you know, one thing that you could use high resolution for, but you wouldn't use it to actually check to see if your master is good. It's an entirely different thing. So. More is not necessarily better. Um, you kind of you learn from all of this that um, if we have a better spectrum analyzer that with higher resolution, it's not necessarily going to tell us the right thing that we want to look at. Sometimes we want to look at the average and see how things are kind of, generally speaking, how is the base balance compared to the high end? And that's a great thing for span because what you could do with span is just set the block size to 256. Just kind of watch, generally speaking, how is it balanced? <laughs> That's a little lower. Now it's higher. It's a lot louder. So that's a lot in terms of mastering. That's kind of what you'd use that for. So you uh, use lower resolution to kind of see the average of things and just kind of see the general sound signature and the way it's shaped. Um, and then you could also um, change it to a high resolution to kind of see what's happening in the high end and stuff like that. Now note that setting this to higher resolution like this is going to be insanely taxing on your computer and this is probably going to uh, cause this everything to slow down quite a bit. But that's a lot of detail you might not necessarily need. And it just kind of slows things down. So, um, so you, there's one thing that I want to kind of close this out with, and that is don't always follow metering. You use metering as a guide when you can't tell when you're listening, um, and you kind of just want to look and see what mathematically the difference is. And the big deal here is do not just look at, um, like for instance, the sound signature here, you could get the uh, span and just kind of say, okay, well, I'm going to look at the, uh, just kind of said 256. Look at the sound signature here. And in mine, and then try to figure out what the difference is and EQ it the exact same. Now, if your track has different elements and it's got kind of like a different uh, sort of a way that it's playing out the genre, then that could be completely wrong. If you like EQ to make them exactly the same, the sound could be completely wrong. So uh, just keep in mind, you trust your ears first and you use meters to kind of, um, just to double check and for things that you can't tell with your ears. So, uh, so long video here and basically uh, I, I covered metering in a lot more depth than I wanted to just because um, metering is one of those things that I, I like to um, look at as uh, something that you shouldn't um, you shouldn't focus on. So so I didn't want to cover metering too much because uh, I didn't want it to be something that you pay attention to more. Um, I wanted to talk about the mastering process in pushing your track as far as you can while retaining the sound and um, and not worrying about other tracks because when you're first starting to master, you are going to notice that your tracks are not going to push anywhere near, well, actually, I can't say that for sure because there are some people out there that do really good on their first masters and it surprised me. But um, but typically, your first master will uh, will not reach the, the RMS levels of professional masters. And you might be asking yourself, why is that? Why is that? Well, it's one of those things that just takes practice. And don't just push it uh, as far as you can to get it to that level um, just because then your track could be harmed by that and you 
you know, um, go away. Um, and you, you kind of focus more on the numbers and the math behind it and you don't actually listen to the track. So that's why I didn't want to cover mastering or mastering. That's why I didn't want to cover metering when I, uh, when I first started this series, but I kind of decided that it would be good to go into metering, just kind of tell you what's important, what's not important, how different, uh, when you look at tools in different ways, it kind of shows you the different aspects of the track. And we could go in and say even more so if I look at this meter, this is the same meter that we are looking at in TR meter right here. Um, the phase meter and if if I kind of say right here, how does it translate to uh, stereo? You notice that with the piano there it was um, it was very round and it wasn't supposed to be in mono um, And that's kind of the way things work, you know, maybe in your break you want sounds that are a lot more um, in stereo So there's a lot less focus on mono, but that'd be your break and you'd have to make that decision and you'd find out this sort of information, if you can't tell by listening, by using the meter on professional tracks and kind of looking at their tracks and seeing, okay, how does their stereo look when they go into the break? How does it look when they go into the drop? And just kind of comparing for things you can't tell when you're listening. So, a lot of information there, and I bet, uh, I, I kind of feel that there was a lot of helpful information in here as well, just because this was one of the things that I didn't want to cover, but I ended up feeling like it was kind of necessary to cover. Um, I should have had it like this, it would have been a lot more helpful to see things. Um, but, uh, you, there's, you know, it kind of, uh, I didn't want to put focus on metering, that's why it kind of ended up being the last video in this series and why I didn't want to cover it in the first place. And, um, but at the same time, you know, it, it's important that I kind of tell you uh, what it's good to use metering for and what you should kind of try to avoid using metering for. And once again, just to reiterate, don't resort to metering all the time. You should use metering as kind of like you're checking um, but most of the time you should be using your ears. If it, if, uh, if, if it sounds good to your ears, but it doesn't sound or it doesn't look right on the meter, like it's really low on the meter or something like that, but then you try to push it farther and it sounds bad to your ears, then stop caring about the meter because um, if you can't push it any further, there's no point in trying to push it further just so that the meter says you're at the right lo loudness level because then that's destroying your track and, and nobody will want to listen to your track because um, it might be loud enough compared to professional tracks, but it doesn't sound good anymore. It's distorting and clipping all over the place and not in a good way like Tritonal's track does. So, uh, so you know, once again, it's mastering is an art and mastering is something that you're going to have to work on just like mixing. So if you thought mixing was hard, well, mastering will probably turn out to be hard as well. Uh, personally, though, I picked up mastering a lot faster than I picked up mixing, but that's just because the same tools you use for mastering are the, are the tools you use for mixing. You just use them in a different form. So I just had to learn that new form. And once I got more used to it, you kind of tell here, I basically have a track that is, I wouldn't say on par with professional tracks, but it's very, uh, it's comparable to them. It can actually stand up to professional tracks. And I could use it in an example like this and kind of show you, I could actually place my track in the middle here because it kind of shares two different things um, between these two tracks. And no, I didn't actually plan this. I just dropped in two tracks of the same genre, of the same general sound style. Um, you could kind of tell the drops were all uh, very... It's a very similar drop sound, so uh, that's kind of what I was shooting for. So, um, so you know, my track just ended up actually fitting better than I thought. I thought I was going to be saying all the things that was wrong with my track, but it ended up being okay. You know, there, like I said, there are some things I could change. Like I could push it further or I could kind of bounce it out a bit more, put a little bit more bass in it so that it kind of, these ones both have more bass. So I kind of just says mine doesn't have quite enough bass. But that's beside the point. Uh, I'm done with this track. I've mastered it. I'm not going back to it. That's kind of the way mastering works for me. Once I finish, I don't go back and remaster it. Except for, you know, the weird occasion that I did it for you guys. And I was just kind of showing you when I went back and remastered something and I actually got a better master. That was kind of an interesting thing from last week. So anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. I hope this was helpful and I'll see you in the next video.